Today we are going to move on to the next topic, perception. Okay, what is perception? Before we go into the details of perception, let's have some thought experiments first. First question, if someone asks you what is color, how would you respond? Okay, imagine that person who asks you this question is not a human being. Imagine there is an alien. This alien creature is from some planet, faraway planet, and that alien comes to the Earth. For some reason, you can communicate with this alien. Okay, you can speak this alien's language. And that alien, let's just assume it's a he. He doesn't know how human beings process light. So that alien asks you, for you human being, what is color? How would you respond to this alien? Does anyone want to give it a try? If you want to explain what color is to an alien who doesn't see colors, could you try to explain it? Does anyone want to try? Okay. Probably it is not very easy. You can keep this question in mind and think about it even after today's lecture. The next question, probably it will be harder if you, for you to imagine how an alien tries to understand what color is. But what about for another person? Like for the, per for the person who sits next to you, the person who sits next to you is also another human being. So of course, that person sees colors as well. But are you sure you too see the same colors? Imagine there is something red, and you call it red. And the person who sits next to you also calls it red. But are you sure that the red for both of you, are they the same red? Or they could be different? Actually, this is a question that can't, that can't be verified because you can't know how the other person feels or perceives unless you become the other person, which is impossible. Okay. But that is something you can try to imagine. Probably the person who sits next to you, he sees a different red than yours, but you both call it red. But heaven knows whether your red is the same as his red. Not only for vision, but for what about for other senses? For example, for hearing. We hear sounds every day. But what is sound? How, why, how would you define what a sound is? And I believe you have learned about this when you were in high school or even earlier. A sound is caused by the vibrations of the air. So the vibration of the air, when that vibration hits your ear, then it becomes a sound. Probably this is a standard answer for what a sound is. Then. Try to think about this scenario. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, when I say no one, it includes no people, no any animal. If no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Does the sound still exist? Okay, let's do a simple survey. If you think under this kind of scenario, the sound still exists. Raise your hands. No one is there and tree falls now. Okay, thanks. If you think there's no sound in this scenario, raise your hand. Okay, fewer people think there's no sound. 
Actually, that question depends on how you define what sound is. If you think sound is the vibration of the air, and that's it, and of course, the sound still exists. But if you think sound is more than that, sound is something created, or sound is something caused. It's just caused by the air vibrations, but it has to be perceived. Then it becomes a sound. Then under this kind of definition, probably you would think the sound doesn't exist. But in, in any case, when, when it comes to the sound, yes, we need the vibrations of the air to cause a sound. But are you sure that, for example, let's imagine there is a piano and someone hits you know, a central C, a C note on the piano keyboard. And are you sure that the C note you hear is the same as the C note the person sits to, ne ne next to you hears? probably different. You both call it a C note, but prob probably you hear different sounds. But you will never know how he hears, and he will never know how you hear. Okay. Actually, for imagine, to imagine how other people feel, probably you wouldn't think other people will feel too, different from, too differently from you do. But if you imagine other animals, for example, a bat, being full. You know, a bat can do a lot of things in dark. But for human beings, we can't do much in dark because we rely on vision a lot. But for a bat, a bat can do a lot of things in the dark. The reason is, in addition to vision, the bat also has another sense. We call it echolocation, to help him get around, to help him pray. Okay. But what is echolocation? Okay. Probably some of you know that a bat can make ultrasonic sounds, a sound that can't be heard by people. Whenever a bat makes ultrasonic sounds, then when those sound hits, for example, when those sound hit the wall, it will be reflected. So the bat will receive the reflection to estimate whether there is a wall. This is how a, a bat is getting around in dark. Probably you will be curious about how a bat does it. You know, for a human being, because we don't have the echolocation sense, so for us, it is really very hard to imagine how a bat feels. Because a bat has a totally different sense system from yours. And so you, it's hard to imagine. But this, by the same token, what about you and the person who sits next to you? Although you are two human beings, of course, if you compare the DNA distance, the person who sits next to you has closer, more similar DNA than, say, the difference between you and the bat. But in, in either of the case, in both of the, ca in both of the cases, you know, you and your friend, of, of course you are both human beings, but even you are both human beings, you don't share exactly the same DNAs. You have DNA, you have different DNA makeups, and of course you have different brains. So supposedly, you two, no one knows whether you two perceive the same thing. Probably you two feel, perceive different things as well. Okay. Uh, let's begin with this dress. I showed this dress a few weeks ago. For this dress, some people feel that it's blue and black. Some people, they feel it's not blue and black. It's white and kind of goldenish. That picture was once quite popular, like on Facebook, on many social media. Why did people want to talk about this dress? Because people always have an assumption. Most of us have an assumption that everyone should see the same thing. 
So there is the same, there is a dress. For the same dress, supposedly everyone should see the same colors. Okay. But turns out people see different colors. So that's why people were surprised. How could it be possible that the same dress is perceived to be different by different people? How could it be possible? People were, were surprised by this. That's why that dress became very popular. That's why that picture of that dress went viral one year and a half ago. But to be honest, is it really surprising that people see different colors? If you think about it, why do you have to see something similar to other people? Because for you, the external stimuli, they are just materials. Visual, system, visual perception happens in your visual system. People have different brains. Your brain is different from the brain of your friends. So of course, you could see different things from your friend. So it's actually not too surprising that the same dress is seen differently because different people have different brains. They have different perceptual systems. So actually, if you think about it, it's not too surprising that people see the same thing differently because the same thing is processed in different brains. Your visual system is different from the others. So it's actually not too surprising that you see something different. And the reason why you feel it's surprising is because you have an assumption. The assumption is people should see the same thing, but no one really knows whether this assumption is correct or wrong. Okay. Although, when we are talking about perception, we usually begin with vision, and most of us have an assumption that what is vision? Vision has something to do with the eye. The eye should be the most important for vision. Yes, the eye is important, but it's not, it's important, but it's not sufficient. In some, of, in some of the cases, you have a normal eye, but you don't have normal vision. Let's have a look at this video. Okay, this guy, his name is Kevin. Unfortunately, Kevin had a car accident a few years ago. After the accident, his eyes are still normal, still functional, but he got his brain injured. And after this injury, his vision's got some problems. The problem is, whenever you ask him what he sees, he, see, he would tell you, okay, I can see colors, I can see shapes. Actually, this is not a very usual response. Because when, when people ask you what you see, you would tell people that I see, I see, I see chairs, I see desks, I see a classroom, I see other people, okay, I see doors, I see windows. No one would tell you that I see shapes and colors. So when they tell you I see shapes and colors, in a way they are telling you that I can't see objects, but I can see red, green, blue, yellow. I can see a circle. I can see something rectangular. I, I can see something round. But those shapes and those colors, they just never come together. Okay, just like Kevin. Okay, for him, if you show him a spoon, for example, okay, actually for him, he can't see a spoon immediately. He can see something silver, something kind of shining, something long, and then he has to use the memory. <laughs> he has to try to reason, try to think about what object could be silver and long and kind of shining. It should be a spoon. So for him, he can't see object immediately. He has to kind of guess what it could be by those shapes and those colors. And probably he has to use other senses. He probably has to touch the object or smell it or try to make sound. He can't just see it immediately. So in his case, he has normal eyes, but it's not sufficient. Still, it's not enough. Even you have normal eyes, it doesn't guarantee that you can see things 
normally. So there should be something else other than eyes to give you vision. But undeniably, eyes are important. Although it's not sufficient, but probably it's necessary. When we are talking about something sufficient, it means that you just need the eye to have vision, which is not the case. You, you need something else other than vision. But probably eyes, they are necessary condition, which means if you don't have eyes, you don't have vision. In most of the cases, yes, if you don't have the eye, you will see nothing. But to be honest, this statement is not 100% correct. Because if I can develop a technique to stimulate your brain directly without the eye, you can still have vision without the eye. But with the current technology we have, we still can't do it completely. Okay. So at this moment, until now, the eyes are important. So let's begin with the eye. So this is your eyeball. This is your eyeball. Why do we need an eyeball? The reason is there are many structures in the eyeball and one of them is lens. Not only lens, but there are still other structures. But the functions of those structures is to enable the light to be focused on the retina. Retina, retina, this is retina. Retina is on the back of your eye. And when whatever you see in the environment, the image has to be focused on the retina. Why do they have to be focused on the retina? It is because there are neurons on your retina and those neurons will convert the light into action potentials. Okay, action potentials again. We talked about action potentials last week. We spent almost one hour talking about those sodium potassium ions coming in, coming out, those complicated processes. The reason why we spend so much time on it is because that mechanism, you know, action potentials, this is the language that our brain could understand. You know, your brain, inside of your head, is dark. There's no light in your head. So the visual information can't be processed with the form of light in your brain. It has to be converted into something your brain can understand, which is action potential. And who you know, translates light into action potentials? No, retina do. It does. It translates light into action potentials. So this is the structure of your retina. Basically, your retina comprises many neurons. And, okay, so this is the function of your retina. It converts light into action potentials. So if you look at this picture, the reason we have to make the light to be focused on the retina is because it is your retina that converts the light into action potential so your brain can understand the information. And after the retina, the information will be sent to your brain. Okay, this is your brain and this is the back of your brain. Your back of your brain processes your visual information. So in your biology classes in high school, probably you have learned that or we have different lobes in your, uh, in our, on our brain. We have frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, whatever lobe it is. And the back of your brain, which is the occipital lobe, is the location where vision occurs. Yes, in a way it's correct. Because the back of your brain, which is the primary visual cortex, is, it is the first stop of your visual information processing. But it is not everything. Even after the occipital lobe, other parts of your brain is also processing your visual information. But the back of your brain is the first stop. That is, that is why we call it the primary visual cortex. So the information comes from the, the, the eyes here and it will be sent to the back of your brain and then it will be sent to the other areas of the brain. Information is processed here through the form of action potentials. And we, never, we don't know when it is, where it is. Somehow, somehow, those action potentials become 
vivid perception, become a feeling of the tree. Now this is the tree, the light from the tree. And the light from the tree is com converted into action potentials. And those action potentials are processed in your brain. And for some reason, those action potentials become the perception of the tree. For this connection, we relatively know more about how the lights are converted into action potentials and how those action potentials are transmitted in the brain. We know a lot about this, but we still don't know why and how and where those action potentials, you know, those sodium potassium ions coming coming out things, how do they become the subjective feeling of seeing a tree? In philosophy, we have a term to describe the subjective feeling. We call it a qualia. So when you see a tree, actually you are not seeing a tree. What you see is the product of your visual processing of a tree. And that product, we call it qualia. That qualia of the tree may or may not different from the original tree. Okay. They may be quite similar, but no one actually knows whether how, how similar, similar or how dissimilar they are. And also, the same tree could be processed differently depending on what the brain is. So the qualia you have of a tree probably is different from the qualia your friend has. Okay. Because you have a different brain from your friends. So the qualia produced by your brain is probably not the same as the qualia produced by your friend's brain. And we don't really know how those action potential, how do they become the subjective, subjective feeling of a tree. We, do not, we actually do not know this connection. And probably we can't really know it by science because unless you become the other person, otherwise you would never get the qualia of the other persons. And you can't become another person. So by no, there's no way you can understand what, a, what, the, what the qualia is for another person. So this is the structure of your retina. The light comes from here and it hits the retina. And there are three layers of cells on your retina. They are photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells. Photoreceptors. Photo, the word, the, the word root, photo here means the light. So they are receptors receiving light. So that is, their function is to convert the light into action potentials. And we have two kinds of photoreceptors. One group is cones, the other group is rods. The reason why we call them cones is because they look like cones. When you are eating an ice cream, the thing that holds the ice cream, they are cones. And that's why we call them cones. And rods, they just look like rods. So this is the first stop the first layer of cells on your retina and then they send information to the next layer which is the bipolar cells and then the bipolar cells will send information to the next level which is the ganglion cells. Okay. In addition to that, there is something tricky on our retina. This tricky thing is, imagine the light comes from the left and this is your eye so this is the back of your eye retina and there are three layers of neurons on your retina the first layer is photoreceptor cones or rods and they send 
information from themselves to bipolar cells to ganglion cells. Okay. And remember, your retina is a two-dimensional surface. It's not just one point. It's a surface. So there are more than one photoreceptor, bipolar cells and ganglion cells. They are everywhere on the, your retina. Here is something tricky. If you look at the direction of the light, it comes, fr it comes from the left. But if you look at the direction of the information transmission, it's from the right to the left. And where is the brain? The brain's there. So eventually, you have to send information to that area. But here is the direction of the action potential. It's from the right to the left. But the brain is on the right, which means that somewhere on the retina, there should be an exit somewhere on your retina. Let's say it's here. And then all those neurons, they have to go through this exit to leave their eye to the brain. There should be a spot on your retina acting, acting like an exit, like acting like a gate, an exit. All the neurons will go through that exit to go to the brain, which also means that there are no photoreceptors on that spot. If there is no photoreceptors, let's say if there is a light coming from here, and when, they, when this light hit that location, no one is translating this light into action potential. So your brain doesn't know that there is a light at this location. When there is something but your brain doesn't see it, we call it blind. So that spot, we call it the blind spot. Because basically you are blind to whatever hitting the area of the retina. But you might be wondering if there is a spot, if there is a blind spot on our, in our eye, how could I never notice it? <laughs> okay. There are several reasons why you, didn't, you never noticed it. One of the reasons is simple, that because you have two eyes. So the blind spot from the one eye could be covered by the, other, by the other eye. Yes, this is one of the reasons. But even you close one of your eyes, you still don't see any blind spot. You still can't notice anything missing. Even you, you just see, you, if you, even you close one eye. Because there should be something else. Okay. But before we talk about how our brain processes the information of the blind spot, we have to make you see the blind spot first. Okay. There's one way you can actually see the blind spot or actually feel the blind spot. With this exercise, because everyone is sitting at different distances, so it's hard to, for everyone to see blind spot with this slide. So please prepare one piece of paper. You just get any piece of paper, okay? Just get, take one piece of paper, anything, any color from your notebook. Just take one piece of paper. And it could be any color. And on that piece of paper, on the right side, please draw a cross, a cross. And on the left, please draw a dot. It doesn't have to be very big, just a small dot. And the distance between them is around probably 10 centimeters. It doesn't have to be very precise. You don't have to use a ruler, just roughly 10 centimeters, okay? The cross on the right and a dot on the left with the distance of roughly 10 centimeters.
And then please cover your right eye. Please use your left eye to look at the cross. And then adjust the distance of that piece of paper roughly at about 20 centimeters away. You know, the, the, eye, the distance between your eye and that piece of paper roughly is 20 centimeters. At that point, you will find that that dot disappears, which is your blind spot. Does anyone need help? You have to adjust the distance, okay? And the distance is roughly, it's not too long, roughly 20 centimeters away. And the distance between the dot and the cross is, is roughly 10 centimeters. And supposedly, that dot would disappear. Has anyone found your blind spot? If you have found it, raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Yes, most people have found it. Okay. So that is your blind spot. There is indeed somewhere out there that you just can't see anything coming from there. Another interesting thing about the blind spot is because for the introductory psychology, we wouldn't talk too much about the blind spot. But in, in another class, I have another class. In that class, I only teach perception. And we will spend quite a lot of time talking about the blind spot in, that, in the other class. The blind spot has also something interesting because you can do this like after you go back home. If you draw something like this, Okay, a big circle with the, with those radiant lines inside of the circle, and also you draw a cross here. Okay, if you also also do the same thing, cover your right eye to use your left eye to look at that cross, and adjust the distance of the piece of paper. At some point you will find that you can actually see the lines in the center of the circle. Even physically, there's nothing there, but you will see the lines. The reason is your brain actively does something on the blind spot. Your brain would use whatever on the surroundings to fill into the center of the blind spot. So in this case, if you are using a white piece of paper, your brain will use the color of white to fill into the blind spot. And if you are using a blue piece of paper, and your brain will use the color of blue to fill it into the blind spot. And if you are using very complicated lines in the surroundings, your brain will also use those lines to filling into the center of the blind spot. This process, we call it perceptual filling in. It's a bit like a camouflage. You know, your brain actually will use whatever in the surroundings to insert it into the blind spot. That's why you never notice blind spot, because for you, whatever in the blind spot, they just look exactly the same as whatever around that blind spot. Next. Now, information has left the retina through blind spot. So we are going to the next stop of the visual information processing. Okay. Look at the picture here. These are your eyes. And the information now, the nerves, they have left the, the retina. And then the next stop of the information is the brain. So this is how, how your eyes and brains are connected. Okay. So if you look at the picture here, there is a cross. We call it optic chiasma. The reason why I call it chi chiasma is because that cross, it looks like a Greek alphabet, chi. So that's why we call it optic chiasma. Okay. Why do we need this 
kind thing. Because if you still remember what we talked about last week, last week we talked about lateralization, hemispheric lateralization. Uh, most part of most part of our left body is processed by our right brain, and most of our right body is processed in our left brain. But with the vision, the story is slightly complicated. We have two eyes, but it is not that. You know, information from the left eye sent to the right hemisphere, and information from the right eye sent to the left hemisphere. It, it is not like that. It is information from the left visual field goes to the right brain, and information from the right visual field goes to the left brain. What is right visual field and left visual field? Imagine you are looking at this letter A here. Whatever to the right of A is your right visual field, and they will be sent to the sent to your left hemisphere. Whatever to the left of the A is your left visual field, and the information there will be sent to your right brain. Okay. So if you if you look at this picture, there is a white sheep, and there's a black sheep. The white sheep is on the left visual field, and the left visual field is projected into. If you if you look at this, this eye, this is your left eye. The information, the image from the left visual field is projected to the right side. Of your left eye, and eventually, the information has to be sent to your right brain. So there should be a connection between your left eyeball and your right brain. Because of this connection, you need an intersection somewhere in your brain, and that intersection is optic chiasma. Okay, so there is an intersection. In your brain, after the, the intersection, whatever coming from the left side of your visual field is sent to the, your right brain, and whatever coming from the right visual field is sent to your left brain. So, if if it's just hypothetical situation, you you got a stroke, and that stroke damaged your left visual brain visual area. Visual cortex, then you'll be blind. You'll be blind to whatever coming from the right side of the visual field. Okay. So after the after the optic chiasma, then the information is sent to your brain. In your brain, the first place that processes your visual information, we call it. V1. Why do we call it V1? V represents vision, visual or vision. One because it is the first stop. So we call it V1, which means that we still, have, in addition to V1, we have V2, V3, V4, V5, etc. So this is the location of V1, okay, which is at the back of your brain. We also sometimes in some books they also call it the primary visual cortex. Okay, and what does our V one do? Why is our V one important? This is the primary visual cortex. It is the first stop of your visual information processing in the brain. But in addition to that. There are still other places in the brain that are processing visual information. So after the information hits V1, it will become two ways. One way goes, one way goes down here. We call it the what pathway. The reason why we call it what pathway is because it is processing the object, 
identity. The reason why we can understand what we see, what we see, is because the information processing down here. But there is another pathway. We call it where pathway. The reason why we call it where pathway is because the information here on in this stream it helps us know where that object is. Okay, but. It's a little bit too much detail, but what you have to know is, yes, V1 is important. It is the first stop of our visual information processing, but it is not everything. Even after V1, there are still some other areas in your brain that are important to your vision as well. So we just focus on V1, the primary visual cortex. What does our V1 do? Then we have to review this research and these two guys. Okay, their names were Hubel and Wiesel, and their research during the 1960s won a Nobel Prize in 1981. Okay, they got the Nobel Prize because of this finding. Before we go into the finding, we have to introduce some uh, concepts. This concept we call it receptive field. And what is receptive field? Let's assume on the outside of, of the environment there are three areas. Area A, Area B, Area C. They are just three spots on the outside. And then inside of your brain you have three neurons. They are neuron A, neuron B, and neuron C. And there is a connection between those three areas and those three neurons. The connection is whenever there is light on location A, it will activate the neural activities of the neuron A. And in this case, we, called, we would call location A is neuron A's receptive field because whatever on the area A will activate the neuron A. Okay. By the same token, okay, yes, we call it A, the big A, area A is the receptive field of neuron A. By the same token, if you project something on B and neuron B will be activated, we call it, we will say that area B is neuron B's receptive field and so on and so forth. So if you present anything at location C, neuron C will be activated. And we will say that area C is the receptive field of neuron C. This is receptive field. And on our primary visual cortex, aka V1, those neurons in our V1, they all have their own receptive field. Each neuron, they just prefer a certain location on the outside. Okay. One of the neurons probably will, be, will, will like the central location. Probably there will be another neuron that prefer you know, the location on the right side, 30 degrees away. Okay. Each location, each neuron in your V1, they have a preferred locations on the outside. This is one of the features of our primary visual cortex. And in addition to that, they also have a preferred orientation. Okay. So this is a new this is a, just a given neuron. Okay. And if you pre present something vertical, this is a vertical stimulus, the neuron will fire like this. You know, apparently you can see the neuron is very excited because of the orientation, it's, it's preferred orientation. But if you rotate this a little bit, it becomes less excited. Okay. And the reason why they have this kind of preference is because if you look at their receptive field, their receptive field comprises three areas. The central area is the facilitator, facilitatory area. So if you put whatever in the central area, it, that neuron will be excited. But if you rotate that bar a little bit, where it hits the 
inhibitory area, which is on the surrounding. When you hit the inhibitory area, that neuron will reduce its excitement. So in this case, if you rotate this bar a little bit, so you would hit the, hit the inhibitory area, then the neuron becomes not that excited. Okay. This is a very important feature on our V1. And who discovered this? Hubel and Wiesel did. Their discovery let them win Nobel Prize. Okay. Here is a video which will help you understand Hubel and Wiesel more. Now, imagine, okay, for that research, Hubel and Wiesel, they used cats. Okay. Imagine you were, imagine you are the cat that they used, and there is electrodes connecting in one of the neurons in your brain. At the same time, you are looking at this screen. So later, there will be some light in the screen. At the same time, you will hear some sounds. That sounds are the neural activities. Can you hear the sound? The more frequent that sound is, the more excited that neuron is. So apparently, this light bulb has to be around this location to activate that neuron. When it was here, they were silent. But when it hits this area, you can hear the sound. Okay, so this, this is how they discovered the, you know, the features of your primary visual cortex neurons. So to sum up what has been discovered on V1, or the primary visual cortex, what they discovered was on V1 cells, on V1, there is a group of cells. We call them the simple cells. The feature of simple cells is each simple cell has a preferred location and a preferred orientation. That is the basic, basically, that is the major finding or the major information of what we have talked about of the last hour. Okay. But you might be wondering, so what? Each V1 cell has a preferred orientation and a preferred location. And what, how is it related to our day-to-day -day life? In our life, we see things much more complicated than a line segment oriented in a certain way. Okay, then we have to look at something beyond V1. Sorry, before going to something beyond V1, actually on V1, on, on, you, on our V1, we have simple cells, which is that what we talked about in the last hour, but there are also some other cells that are not that simple. We call them complex cells or hyper complex cells, but we are not going into the details of them. Okay, for this course, you just have to know that on V1 cells, there is a group of neurons, we call them simple cells, and each of them has a preferred orientation and a preferred location. But our vision doesn't just end at V1. There are still some other areas in our brain that also process visual information. So now we are looking at something beyond V1. There are a lot of areas beyond V1. Some of them, we are just talking about three of them. This is called extra striate body area okay extra striate you don't have to care about what it means but you just have to look at the word body here why do we call it body area that means they are sensitive to bodies what does what does it mean if you present a body part for example a, an arm okay, or a leg a neck an ear, whatever body part you present to the area, the neurons in that area will fire. So it feels like that neuron, they have a preferred body part. Okay. Uh, also, we've got fusiform body area. 
the same. Those neurons, each of them, has a preferred body part. When you see a particular body part, that neuron will fire, will get excited. This fusiform face area. Yes, those neurons, they are sensitive to faces. So if you present a face, that neuron will get excited. There are actually much more areas than the three, but we are just talking about the three. Among the three, the last one, fusiform face area, or sometimes we just use the abbreviation FFA, probably is the most famous one. Okay. There are a lot of researchers who are interested in this. The reason is because in, in clinical cases, there are some people, they have some damage on their FFA, and the consequence is they can't recognize faces. This kind of syndrome, we call it face blindness, or the Latin term prosopognosia. For those patients, because they have a damage on their FFA, fusiform face area, so they can't recognize human faces. Okay. So, so far, it seems that the neurons in our brain, they all have a preferred thing. On V1, those neurons, they prefer one particular location and one particular orientation. And those neurons in your FFA, they are sensitive or they prefer a particular face. And how are they connected? I mean, how are these findings integrated? One of the ways to integrate them is, you can imagine, on V1, and we have said, we have said that on v, the cells in V1, they have a preferred orientation. So let's say there is a neuron, we call it V1A. And V1A's preferred orientation is horizontal line. And there is another neuron, we call it V1B. And its preferred orient orientation is a vertical line. This is the V1. And they, the two neurons, they both send information to another neuron. We call it, this is V2, V2 alpha. You can imagine what is V2 alpha sensitive to. V2 alpha will be sensitive to a cross. So whenever you present a cross, you are activating V1A and V1B together, concurrently, and they all sent. They all connected. They are all connected to V2 alpha. So the consequence is V2 alpha would be sensitive to cross. So V2, the neurons in V2s, they are sensitive to more complex patterns. So this is V2 alpha. And you can imagine, there is something called V2 beta. And let's say V2 beta is sensitive to a circle. And they all connected to V3. And there is V3. Gamma, just a, it's just a made up name. So you can imagine what would be V you can imagine what would be V3 gamma sensitive to. Probably if you present a symbol of female, for example, the female symbol, then it will activate V3 gamma. And so on and so forth. So their sensitivity will become more and more complicated up to a point like your FFA. A particular FFA neuron will be sensitive to a complex pattern like a face, all starting from a simple orientation. Okay. So this is 
our how our visual system detects or processes shapes. But in addition to shape, there is something we still have to process. But it doesn't seem to fit all this story. This is color vision. Okay. Because in this model, this is just a hypothetical model. Actually, we don't know whether these something you have to keep in mind these connections whether they exist or not we don't know we just know that v1 cells they are sensitive to a particular orientation and we also know that higher cortical areas higher visual cortex they are sensitive to complex complicated patterns but actually we still haven't known that how are they connected but this is just a hypothetical model but even in this model there is no color in this model. Okay. So how do we perceive color? So before going into the detail of color perception, we have to introduce you what causes color perception. First, you need light, of course. And what is light? Light is just one form of electromagnetical energy in the universe okay so in this electrical magnetical energy what human beings can perceive is just one small portion of it this small portion we call it the visible light okay. and within the small portion because it's a wave if you treat it as a wave, then a wave has different wavelengths. So for those long wavelengths, like 700 nanometers, they will be perceived as something reddish. If it is short wavelength, like this one, 400 nanometers, then it will be perceived as something kind of bluish or purple. So this is the visible light. And remember something, that the light itself doesn't contain the color. What does it mean? The light, they have different wavelengths. But actually in the, in the universe, <laughs> the light doesn't have color. They are just waves of different wavelengths. They don't have colors at all. The reason why you see colors is because basically, in a way, your brain creates the colors. The light itself, it doesn't, it's just light. It's just light of different wavelengths. It doesn't have the red, it doesn't have the yellow, it doesn't have the green. Those yellow, green, yellow, purple, pink thing, they are all created in your brain. And you have a different brain from your friends. So, you might see a different red from your friend's red. Okay. So how do we see colors? Now we've known that the light itself doesn't have colors. The reason why we see colors is because somehow our brain creates the colors. But how does our brain create those colors? There have been two theories trying to pr approach this answer. The two theories are trichromatic theory and, and apodent process theory. Trichromatic, this word tri means three, chrome means color. So trichromatic theory is three color theory and op opponent process theory. So what are they? Let's begin with the first one, trichromatic theory or three color theory. Before we go into the details of three color theory, we have to go back to the retina to have a quick look of how retina is comprised of. Our retina has three different layers of cells, photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells. If you look at the photoreceptors, we have two kinds of photoreceptors. One of them is called cone, because they look like a cone. And actually, most of people, I wouldn't say everyone, but most of the people, we have three different kinds of cones. And those threes are L, M, and S. Why do we call it 
L cone, it is because they are sensitive to long waved light. So that's why we call it L, long waved, long wavelength. M, medium, they are sensitive to medium range of wavelengths. Short, as they are sensitive to short wavelengths. So these three different categories of cones, they are sensitive to different wavelengths. So the horizontal axis here denotes the wavelength, and the vertical axis here denotes how, sen how sensitive they are to that wavelength. Most of us have the three. How is it relevant to our color vision? Imagine if you see a blue light. You have three kinds of cones, L, M, and S, and that light will activate your S cones. So your S cones will be very, very excited. The size here denotes how excited, how excited they are. So when you see a blue light, your S cone becomes very excited. And if you see a green light, your M cone becomes excited. And if you see a red light, your L cone becomes excited. And when you see a yellow light, both of your L and M cones are excited, but your short S cone is silent. And if you see a white light, three of them are excited. So basically, each color could be converted into the relative activities of the three. Blue light represents the excitement for the S cone. Green light represents the excitement of the M cone. Red light represents the excitement of the L cone. Yellow light represents excitement for L and M. And white light indicates that three of them are excited. What, what about black? When none of them is excited, then you see black. So basically, every color could be represented by the relative activities of the three different kinds of cones. It is just like when you are trying to present a color on, the, on your computer screen, you use three different parameters. They are RGB, okay, red, green, and blue, just like how your cones represent different colors. And this is the trichromatic theories. Each different, every different color could be represented by the relative activities of the three cones. So for a particular light, the three cones have three different responses. The information of the light is boiled down into three parameters. Okay. Just like if you want to present a particular color on computer screen, you have to use three parameters, RGB. But this RGB thing, it can't explain the following illusion, which is this color after image. Now, please stare at this picture. Stare it. Look at it. No, what do you see on this white screen? Whatever the color you see, they are not the same as the original one. Okay, the original one is kind of red and a little bit or orange and yellow. But then, if I present this white screen, do you see something else? This is called color as after image. But why is it? You can't use that RGB theory or trichromatic theory to explain this illusion because there's no way that 
No, uh, why? How come you see a red thing after a while it becomes something else? There's no way to explain it. For in with this trichromatic theory, that's why there is another theory we call it opponent process theory, which is try t trying to explain why we, do we have color after image. Okay. So according to this opponent process theory, we also need three systems. The three are not RGB. The three systems, they have to be sensitive to black, white, red, green, and yellow, blue. And how do they work? Imagine if you see something red, okay, R, RG. For this RG system, why is it plus and minus? The reason why is R plus G minus is because if you if you present nothing, it is still firing. Okay, let's say the firing rate is 10 per second. It just, it's, just, it's just an example. Okay. Tempor if you present nothing, the firing rate is 10 times per second. And if you present something red, because it becomes it's, it's plus, so it will increase its firing rate. It becomes 100 times per second. And there's a green minus here, which means that if you present something green, that neuron will become silent. Okay. So silent indicate green. 10 times per second indicates nothing. 100 times per second indicates red. So imagine when you're looking at something red for like 30 seconds. So the neuron will keep firing, firing, firing for as long as 30 seconds. Up to a point, you know, the neurons get tired as well. When it's getting too tired, it doesn't fire. So if you look at something red for 30 seconds, after 30 seconds, the neuron becomes extremely tired. Then you take out that red thing, the neuron will stop firing because it's too tired. And when, whenever it doesn't fire at all, your brain will think, probably you see something green. So that's why your neuron doesn't fire. So this is how color Im after image is generated. Because your neurons get tired. And when it gets tired, it doesn't fire. And your, your brain doesn't know the reason why it doesn't fire is because it sees another color or it is just too tired. You d basically, your brain just received whatever coming from the neuron and your brain doesn't know what is happening outside. So when your neuron doesn't fire, when this neuron doesn't fire, your brain will automatically interpret the result as the color of the green instead of the neuron being tired. Okay. And to, to interpret the occurrences of the co color of the image, you need black, white, red and green, and blue, yellow. Okay? Because if you look at something red for a long time, it becomes green. When you look at something yellow for a long time, it becomes blue. When you look at something white for a long time, it becomes black. Okay? You need a three system. But to be more precise, actually, not only these three, you also need, you know, this is black minus white plus. You also need another one, which is black plus white minus. And for this system, you also need another one, which is red minus green plus. For, for this system, you also need another one, which is blue plus yellow minus. Okay. So to be more precise, actually you need six of them. But those six of them could be classified into Black, white, one group. Red, green, second group. Blue, yellow, the third group. Okay. This was originally, originally just a hypothesis, just a theory. But nowadays, yes, there is physiological evidence. We do find somewhere in our brain, retina, and this is LGN. You don't have to care about what LGN is, but it's just a structure in your brain, okay? Somewhere in your brain, including the ret retina on, in your eye, yeah. we do have opponent neurons. And those opponent neurons are just like the three we just talked about. They are, for example, this one, blue plus, yellow minus. 
So spontaneous. Spontaneous means that if you don't give it anything, then it, it is still firing, but with a moderate rate. But if you give it the color blue, it becomes very, very excited, as you can see from here. And if you give it the color of green, it, it becomes not that interested. So the firing rate drops down a little bit. And if you give it the yellow color, it doesn't fire at all. It's just very, 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 very few firing. If you give, if you give it red, it, it does, it's not very interesting as well. So this is blue plus yellow minus. And for this one, red plus green minus. Spontaneous, if you give it nothing, it will fire spontaneously. Okay. But if you give it blue, it becomes even less interested. And then if you give it green, it becomes almost nothing. And this yellow, it doesn't fire a as well. And if you give it red, it becomes very, very excited. So somewhere in our visual system, somewhere in our brain, we do have these three different kinds of neurons, and we call them opponent cells or opponent neurons. So, so far, we've talked about two theories, trichromatic theory, the RGB theory, and also we have physiological evidence for this RGB theory because on our retina, we have three different kinds of cones, and they are sensitive to red, green, and blue. Okay. And for opponent process theory, we also have physiological evidence because somewhere in our brain, we found opponent cells, and they are sensitive to white, black, red, green, or yellow, blue. And how are they integrated together? The way to integrate them is, you can imagine that, you know, this is our color system. It, it, you can imagine it's like a, you know, it's like a company. And this company has three departments. You know, this department white and black, department red and green, department blue and yellow. And in each department, you've got a boss here. You've got employees here. Okay. And the employees will send their information to their boss. And their, their boss will integrate the information from their employees, just like our cones and our opponent cells. Our cones is on our retina, and they are you know, employees. They are in a, they are in, in a lower rank. Okay. So they are processing the external stimuli. So whenever, whenever there's a white light, when, whenever the light is white, it activates three of them. And they all send positive information to their boss. So whenever there's a white light, all of them are excited. And their boss is excited as well. But whenever you see something black, none of them is excited. Because whenever there's a black light, something black, they don't fire. And their boss don't fi doesn't fire as well. This is the black-white department. And there is another department, red-green department. And in this red-green department, there are only two employees. They are the L cone and the M cone, and their boss is this, this guy. And there is no, basically there is no S cone in this department. And in this department, the L cone will send positive information to the boss, and the green, the M cone will send negative information to the boss. So the boss basically will, so whatever comes from the red, it will excite this, this boss. Whatever comes from the green, it will de-excite the boss will deactivate the boss, will inhibitory the actions of the boss. So if you see a red light, this guy is excited, and also the boss is excited. If you see a red green light, this guy is excited, but his excitement will actually decrease the excitement of the boss, because this is minus. And also there is another department, and there are three employees. And two of them, the red guy and the green guy, they send positive information to the boss. And the blue guy will send negative information to the boss. So whenever you see a yellow light, 
the two guys are excited. The red guy and the green guy, they're excited. So is their boss. But if you see a blue light, the blue guy is excited, but it will make their boss depressed. Okay, so this is how the information from the cones are integrated into the opponent cells. So, so far we've talked about you know, two theories, trichromatic theories and opponent cell, opponent process theories. There was upon a, upon, once upon a time, the two theories, they contradicted to each other. But now, nowadays, with the physiological evidence, actually they don't contradict to each other. They don't contradict each other anymore. Both of them are correct. But they are just operating on different levels. For trichromatic theory, it is operating on the cone level. And for the opponent cell theory, it is operating on the opponent cell level. Okay. So, to summarize what we have talked about in color vision, the color vision starts also from your retina because your retina has the cones and you have three different cones. The three different cones are reacting the light differently. Okay. So let's say there are three different lights. They could be 700 nanometers, 500 nanometers, 400 nanometers. There are three different lights and they will be converted into action potentials from your cones. Okay. Re and remember, the light itself, it doesn't have colors. The light is just a light. And it, it's just a light of, of a particular wavelength. It doesn't have the red, it doesn't have the blue, it doesn't have the green, it doesn't have color at all. But your cones on your retina, they are reacting differently to the three different lights. And then they will send their information to their, bo their bosses, which are the opponent neurons. And in the information, it's just transmitting in your brain. And up to a point, you see three different colors. But remember, the three colors that you see in your brain, they are not necessarily the, the, the light itself. I mean, because the light doesn't have color, the, these colors, red, green, blue, they are just somehow, we don't know how, but somehow created in your brain. So that's why that probably the creations, the products of this process in your brain, probably it is not the same as the products in your friend's brain because you have different brains. So even for the, the same light, you too might see it differently. Okay. So for this connection, we now we have known that there are codes and opponent cells. We know about this, but we still don't know why and how those neural activities, how and why do they become this subjective feelings or we call it qualias. You know, the qualia for the red, the qualia for the green, the qualia for the blue, it is somehow created somewhere in your brain. So there are some f f you know, philosophical issues in color vision. That Do color exist? Or some people will say color is just an illusion because as I have repetitively talked, talked about that there is no color in the universe. This color is just something created in your brain. Okay? There, is no, there is no any necessary connection between the short wave light and the feeling of blue. When you see something with short wave length, you perceive it perceive as something blue, but basically there is no connection between, between them. And there is no necessary connection between the long wave length, wave length, wave length and the feeling of red. So probably for the feeling of red, what you see from a red object probably is different from what your friend sees in the same object. Okay? Because the red created in your brain may not be the same or different from the red created in, you, in your friend's brain. And maybe it's just a 
you know, a possibility. Okay, it's not necessarily true. That that is what you see when you see lights with different wavelengths. You see different colors, and maybe that is what your your friend sees. Your friend he also sees different co different colors, different lights, and different colors. But apparently, his feelings is different from your feelings. And probably, this is your classmate sees. This is another guy. He sees something like this. Okay. They also he also sees lights with different wavelengths, but apparently, they look different. And your boss sees. Every probably everyone sees the same thing differently, but there is no problem. There is no difficulty in communication because imagine here there's life, five hundred five hundred seventy nanometers. You call it green, okay? And your your friend also calls it green, although the green he sees is different from the green you see. But you both call it green, so there is no difficult. There is no com like problems in communication. You both call it green. And also, your classmate, this 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 color, he also calls it green. But apparently, the green of his is different from the green of either of yous. Okay, so when we are communicating, when we were when we are interacting with other people, when we are using the common names, there is no difficulty. But it doesn't mean that we see the same thing. Okay. Okay. So that was color vision, and that was vision. Okay. Now we are going to the a different topic. To before we go into hearing, there is another thought experiment. Okay. Imagine there is a big lake. And you put your handkerchief. Now you have a handkerchief huh, on the on one side of the lake, and the lake is quite big. And then, I want you to I want you to do something, which is I want you to use the vibrations of the handkerchief to estimate, to guess what is going on in the lake, just only by the handkerchief, the vibrations of the handkerchief. And you have to tell me what is going on in the lake. Okay. You might think it's hard, almost impossible. But if you think about your ears, actually your ears or your auditory system, it is doing exactly the same thing. Why? Why are they the same? You know what? For the auditory system, what is the beginning of the auditory system? The beginnings. Is you know there, there's a structure called eardrum, or tympanic membrane. Okay, the tympanic membrane is the you know to hear a sound you need the vibration of the ear, and then those vibration of the ear it will hit your tympanic membrane, which is inside of your ear, and the, the your in tympanic membrane will vibrate according to you know the vibration of the ear. And then you just use the information of the vibration of the tympanic membrane to hear things. Okay. Basically, what your ears do is not too different from this handkerchief. Probably the only difference is now I just want to want you to use one handkerchief, but with your ears, you have two ears, so you you have two tympanic membranes, so you have two handkerchiefs to estimate what is going on on the, on the outside. But actually, that is actually what your auditory system does. The only the only material that your ears use is the vibrations of your tympanic membranes, just two of them. And you have you just you have to guess, you have to estimate what is going on. What what like for 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 example, when you are sitting here listening to my lectures, you have to really understand every syllable of my talk, really just based on the vibration of your tympanic membranes. And you have to also know, you have、uh, you you still have to also hear what is, what is going on on the outside. On also only by the two tympanic membranes. It sounds magical, but it it is exactly what your auditory system does. Okay.